Audi's e-tron GT Quattro is a desirable four-door grand touring flagship model for the Ingolstadt maker's growing e-tron EV range. Though most of the core technology here is shared with this car's Porsche Taycan cousin, it's all been delivered with a distinctly Audi feel and character, and most importantly, it has that want one factor. The earliest full EVs from Audi tended to be of the expensive and luxurious sort. First we had the modestly appealing e-tron big SUV, then the rather more desirable e-tron Sportback, followed by this, the e-tron GT Quattro, a four-door Gran Turismo sports saloon, which also comes in faster RS form. It's a standard GT model though, which is our focus here. You might well already know that this car shares a lot of its engineering with its VW Group cousin, the Porsche Taycan, and we mean a lot. The twin electric motors are the same, so is the three-chamber air suspension, so is the 800-volt battery, and so is the J1 platform that everything sits on. Yet Ingolstadt determinedly promises us that this will be a distinctly Audi confection. We're going to see. Quite a lot hangs on this. The automotive industry is rapidly leaving the combustion engine world. In fact, Audi has already effectively ended all development of internal combustion engines. It's very different with EVs. The spiraling cost of development means that much has to be shared between brands to keep prices accessible. And even without that issue, there's a huge degree more engineering conformity with this kind of powertrain. All EVs have, after all, auto transmission, a motor on the front axle, and a heavy battery positioned low and centrally beneath the passenger floor. Luxury EVs like this one all have at least one motor on the rear axle too. Given this degree of uniformity, just how different can future brand engineered EVs really be, particularly in cases like this where over 40% of the components are shared? Audi tells us not to worry and wheels out this e-tron GT as proof that the distinct ingenuity of Vorsprung Dirk Technik will continue to break boundaries in our new electric world. It certainly looks stunningly unique and Ingolstadt promises that it will drive that way too. Are they right? Well, Car and Driving's road test, the industry's most comprehensive video review, will give you the answers. Audi sought to make transition into this car from one of its large luxury models as seamless as possible. At the wheel, where it will be all very familiar if you speak Ingolstadt's current interior design language, uh, there's really very little to do once you get inside. Although a start button on the lower center console is provided, uh, you really won't need to use that because the car senses your presence and it activates its systems as you settle in, ready for you to snick the little gear selector into drive. You're ready. But for what? A rush of blood to the head? Well, it doesn't initially seem like that for the first fraction of throttle travel. And then suddenly everything's released and the car just hurls itself at the horizon. Uh, you can't really blame Audi for wanting to share the engineering of this car with Porsche uh, because it's extremely complex. As this e-tron GT's Quattro moniker suggests, it's four-wheel drive. And that's courtesy of motors at the front and the rear. The back one connected not to the usual single-speed EV transmission, but to a two-speed gearbox, uh, the lower gear of which is used only for launch control and some dynamic modes. Ready for some numbers? Well, total power output, most of which comes from the 435 PS rear motor, is 476 PS, although there's also a boost mode that raises that to 530 PS for rapid overtaking. If you're interested, all these figures are pretty much the same as those of the mechanically identical Porsche Taycan 4S, as is arguably the most important one, uh, that for the 298 mile range, which is okay, but it's some way off what you get from a rival Tesla Model S. The performance stats, of course, are very Taycan-like too, which means they're very fast, 62 from rest, courtesy of that short ratio first gear, occupies just 4.1 seconds on the way to 152 miles an hour. 
Now we can't really imagine why that wouldn't be quick enough for you, but if it's not, there's also a faster version of this car, the RS e-tron GT, which has a gutsier 456 PS rear motor and can therefore offer 598 PS in total or 646 in boost mode. And consequently a supercar style 3.3 second uh, sprint to 62 on the way to 155 miles an hour. The driving range though of that top version falls to 283 miles. Uh, even in the standard model though, the acceleration is pretty arresting the first time you try it, but it can be slightly nauseating on repeated acquaintance. Some might say that about the artificial e-tron sports sound, and that's optional on the most affordable derivative of the standard variant, which has been hourly described as a cross between a tube train pulling out of a station and a starship hitting warp drive. It's certainly very Blade Runner-like, appropriately because uh, this car features in the 2019 Marvel movie Avengers Endgame with Iron Man Tony Stark at the wheel. Actually, you only really notice the sound effects in dynamic mode, and that's the most urgent of the three main drive settings on offer. Uh, the others, as usual, with Audi being comfort and efficiency. Uh, plus, there is uh, also an individual menu, which allows you to alter the parameters for the drive system, uh, the sound profile, and the suspension. Adaptive damping is standard on every model, but unfortunately, the air suspension system, uh, which rightly Porsche deems essential for four-wheel drive versions of this design, isn't. It's a pricey extra on a standard e-tron GT unless you stretch to this vastly more expensive Vorsprung level of trim. Uh, you really want to have it though because it delivers a beautifully damped quality of ride which is probably the thing we like most about this car. Air suspension on some other cars doesn't always feel that way, but Porsche always insists on a proper three-chamber system, so that's what the e-tron GT gets here. It's a setup which can lower the body from its standard setting by up to 22 millimeters, or raise it by up to 20 millimeters. In efficiency mode, where top speed is limited to 87 miles an hour, the body's positioned at the lower level in the interests of airflow. In dynamic though, where the electric all-wheel drive system operates with a rear bias, the suspension is primed for optimal composure, taking advantage of the fact that the chambers in each spring can be activated and deactivated individually to suit whatever driving situation you happen to be in. Add in the air springs to a base trimmed model which requires specifying an expensive optional pack and you'll be paying pretty much uh, exactly what Porsche will want to charge you uh, for a comparable Taycan 4S with the higher 93 kilowatt hour level of battery output which Audi wisely has standardized here. Either way, uh, for your near six figure spend, you'd be getting yourself a very uniquely sophisticated and high performance Gran Turismo luxury EV. Uh, let's cover off the engineering basics, which we'll try to describe in a way that doesn't actually require a physics degree for you to fully understand it. That battery pack powers the two synchronous electric motors we mentioned earlier on, one on each axle, and both of the permanently excited sort, which sounds like a toddler with a sugar fetish, but actually describes the way that the rotors of each AC motor create a permanent magnetic field, which delivers more efficient, constant, and denser power delivery, and that's further aided by clever hairpin stator wiring. The front motor drives its axle through an open differential, while the motor at the rear, which is more powerful, as we said, in the RS e-tron variant, uh, drives through a torque vectoring e-differential, which is linked to the two-speed automatic gearbox that we mentioned earlier on. Now, EVs normally produce so much torque that they tend to decimate transmission systems of this sort when they're repeatedly used for race-style starts, but this one uses an epicyclic gear train and a dog clutch with a multi-plate oil bath unit to ease changes, and that seems to have done the trick. Still with us? Well, this is clever stuff. All of it's been engineered to work with a veritable arsenal of Porsche and VW Group engineering in an attempt to try to make a car with a lumbering 2.4 ton curb weight of a Range Rover handle something like a proper sports saloon should. Uh, none of the dynamic stuff in play here is anything that we haven't seen before uh, and there's no option for the kind of 
clever electromechanical roll stabilization system uh, that you could have on a pricier Taycan. But with a Porsche developed 4D chassis control setup, coordinating everything all together like a conductor of an orchestra, uh, the result through the turns is really very impressive indeed when you consider the amount of weight that's in play here. Though obviously this car's naturally low center of gravity certainly helps. Uh, you turn in, it grips, it goes, and then you simply put your foot down and you instantly find yourself somewhere else. But what of the drive dynamics that we were promised would, like the look of this car, be uniquely Audi? Well, there's a bit of that in the ride quality, which, uh, whatever damping setup you choose, has a slightly softer edge than you'll find in the Taycan. But mostly the differentiation between the two cars lies in the steering, which is quite different in an e-tron GT, especially in a standard unoptioned version, which will lack the more direct power steering plus setup that we've been trying here. Uh, instead of the all-round feelsomeness of the Porsche, this rack is just like the one that Ingolstadt's other models are well known for. So it's light at the straight ahead, it's initially direct as you turn in, but then it's slightly vague when you want to feel it most. Enthusiasts will of course prefer Zuffenhausen's take on this, but uh, there really wasn't much point in this being simply another copied carryover, and those with Grand Touring in mind might actually prefer it. Especially perhaps if, as here, the rack is embellished by the all-wheel steering system which is restricted to Vorsprung and RS models. Uh, with that, at speeds of up to 31 miles an hour, a spindle drive turns the rear wheels in the opposite direction to the fronts by up to 2.8 degrees and that improves uh, manoeuvring and the turning circle, of course. At higher speeds, where the system's roll switches to promoting cornering stability, the rear wheels turn slightly in the same direction as those at the front. Higher speeds usually decimate the battery capacity of heavy luxury EVs and that is pretty much the case here, although only if that very rapid speed is constant. Uh, gratifyingly, a quick right foot flex away from rest on a motorway slip road or passing that swaying arctic in front of you doesn't appear to have too much of an effect on range, so you can enjoy this e-tron's performance without feeling too guilty. It stops well too, even without the steel brakes getting the tungsten carbide coating that's applied on the RS models. Around 30% of the retardation is of the brake regenerated kind, although you might not really guess that uh, because unlike some other EVs, this one's recuperation system can't be set to really noticeably arrest the car when you come off the throttle. Silver paddles for this purpose uh, reside behind the steering wheel here, but activating them doesn't appear to make much of an overt difference. And without you doing anything at all, uh, at cruising speeds, the regenerative braking effect automatically disconnects itself in the comfort and the efficiency modes to allow you to coast. It all means that uh, you'll probably revert to merely using the automatic level of recuperation that you can select from the center screen, uh, leaving the car to do its own thing. And its own thing is extremely likable in the highway drive conditions that this model was designed for. It's got predictive drive cleverness, which uh, anticipates and adapts the drivetrain for turns, gradients and roundabouts. And of course, it's pretty silent at a cruise, although to some extent all that does is to draw your attention to little interior creaks and rattles that are seemingly betraying the fact that build standards at Audi's Nikazon factory aren't quite as tight as those at uh, Porsche's Zuffenhausen plant. So there are differences between this car and its Taycan cousin. Some you might actually like, uh, the steering may be, the ride definitely, and perhaps the more familiar cabin design with its low seating position. But even if you don't, you can't help but admire what's been achieved here. Vorsprung Dirk Technik might have a bit of a different focus these days. It's now charged with delivering the Ingolstadt brand into a new era, but the e-tron GT showcases it as effectively as any of its combustion predecessors. It's very cool, it's very sophisticated, and it's very Audi. We've never seen an Audi quite like this before. Ingolstadt rather immodestly describes the external design of the e-tron GT as a work of art. 
Whatever your perspective, it's refreshing that for the first time, the brand has brought us an all-electric model which isn't an SUV. And it's certainly striking, the long wheelbase, the wide track, the large wheels, and the low-lying silhouette provides beautifully balanced, sleek, and aerodynamic proportions. The drag coefficient is rated at 0.24 CD. That's the lowest of any current Audi, although it's still not quite as slippery as a Taycan or a Model S. The dimensions are those of a classic Grand Tourer with a 4.99 meter length and 1.96 meters of width, but a height of just 1.41 meters. To give you some perspective, I think in terms of a car about the length of an Audi A6, but one much wider and lower with dimensions very similar to the model that Audi must have benchmarked in development, the Tesla Model S, which for reference is a couple of centimeters shorter and half a centimeter wider. That development, by the way, was astonishingly quick. The first cars left the production line just two years after the concept model was revealed at the Los Angeles Motor Show. This has a great deal to do with the fact that this was the first Audi to be productionized without the use of physical prototypes. It's also, incidentally, the first Audi EV to be built in Germany at Neckarsholm alongside the brand's classic R8 Super Sports car. Plenty to consider then as you admire what Mark Lichter and his design team have achieved here. The elongated bonnet and flat windscreen merge elegantly into a rapidly sloping roof line and the glass house extends tautly over the powerful body, drawing in particularly sharply towards the rear where gently inclined C pillars blend beautifully with the body's muscular shoulders. Sharp edges give particular definition to the large wheel arches forming quattro blisters which visually reference the presence of a new generation of electric quattro all-wheel drive. The arches house big wheels offering the requisite dose of pavement presence, usually 20 inches in size, although many owners will want to upgrade to the 21-inch black 10-spoke trapezoidal aero rims we have here. We're not sure if the front aesthetics are quite as successful, not very taken with this version of Audi's single frame grille, most of which is filled up by this rather ugly Heckler grey front panel. You can pay extra to have this finished in body colour and RS versions are differentiated by having it finished in black, but either way, it's not the car's most appealing feature and it's not helped by a lower open part filled with big forward-facing cameras. The triple ribbing which uh, surrounds that lower open area looks good though, as do the vertical corner air intakes. And the distinctive 3D signature of the LED headlamps delivers the requisite level of overtaking presence, especially when these lights are optioned up with the Audi laser light technology we're trying here, which incorporates an extra spot which activates at over 43 miles an hour, doubling the beam range. At the rear, this full-width light strip is a typical Audi touch, but the e-tron GT is set apart from other models in the brand's portfolio by this visually offset lower diffuser. This is a culmination point for air that flows beneath the smooth underbody, which then disperses cleanly off the rear end. It's directed by an active spoiler, which extends electrically into a couple of different positions, depending on how fast you're going. The idea being to compensate for the lift that occurs at the rear axle at high speeds. As usual though, what's even more important is what you can't see, the stiff, sophisticated, aluminium-rich J1 platform that this car shares with its VW Group cousin and its closest market rival, Porsche's Taycan. Uh, built on this chassis are components made of hot-shaped and therefore ultra-high strength steel, which form the strong backbone of the passenger cell, helping to maximize rigidity and noise suppression in combination with targeted insulation measures throughout the entire body. So distinctly Audi outside, let's open this frameless door and find out whether it'll also be so at the wheel. Absolutely. If you happen to be familiar with the driver-focused monoposto-style cockpit design of the brand's R8 sports car, you'll feel right at home in an e-tron GT. Its cosseting, low-set driving position places you right in the middle of the action, just as you would be in this model's Taycan cousin, although, as we were promised, the uh, front-of-cabin experience here is very different. 
and it's actually far more interesting. Uh, the upper section of this light, lean instrument panel with its pronounced three-dimensional look uh, forms an elegant arc uh, within which the display of the Audi virtual cockpit instrument screen stands freely, while the MMI Touch central infotainment screen with its uh, piano black finished bezel appears to float in this central space. Uh, this wide centre console, which uh, houses the gear selector switch, runs higher between the seats than it does in that Porsche, which uh, does make the cabin feel rather more cockpit-like. And the dramatic design has left no space for the second lower climate screen that you get in other expensive Audis. But it's certainly very high-end in here, full of suede and carbon fibre and immaculately stitched leather. Unless you want the feeling that you've entered a whole new era of technology with your luxury EV, one thing you might really like about this e-tron GT's cabin is it all feels so familiar because everything below this huge panoramic windscreen is so authentically Audi. You get in, you look around, you drive away, it's so straightforward. And on the move, because Audi still believes in physical switches and knobs, there's no need to search around for what you need in screen menus and battle with fiddly touch-sensitive buttons. Uh, instead, there are a conventional climate controls, uh, this rotating volume knob on the steering wheel, and a sliding gear selector down here, which is more engaging to use than it looks. Even the central touchscreen would rather be tapped than touched, which then delivers you its haptic feedback click. Uh, like the instrument display, it's smaller than the one used in the Taycan, but most will find the 10.1 inch size to be sufficient and perhaps appreciate that surprisingly, this e-tron is the only car in this class to offer both Apple CarPlay and Android Auto smartphone mirroring. Its uh, state-of-the-art MIB3 modular infotainment platform can't allow you to play games or watch Netflix as the comparable system can in a Tesla, but it's certainly quite rapid at delivering the info that you'll need. Uh, there's conformity to the fast LTE advanced transmission standard and the incorporated Audi Connect navigation and infotainment package that includes services like traffic information online, uh, navigation with Google Earth and car to x communication. There's natural voice control too, although it's still not as intuitive as the systems from BMW and Mercedes. Accessing everything you need is pretty straightforward. The main menu has the usual radio, media, telephone, nav, apps and car sections. Plus you can swipe left for weather, news and calendar sections or right for a customizable split screen layout. Uh, when you're in particular sections, uh, helpful shortcut options on the right hand edge of the screen, uh, they allow you to quickly navigate onto what you'll need. We'd still prefer a lower iDrive style controller though. Uh, for the audio system, Audi does provide this little touchpad on the transmission tunnel by the gear selector, but it's a bit small and it's quite fiddly to use. Everything else you need to know lies on this 12.3 inch virtual cockpit instrument screen, which changes its layout according to the way you tap the view button on the spoke of this flat bottom steering wheel. As usual with this Audi display, there's a basic format with two dials separated by a central infotainment section. Uh, you can customize that with EV data, audio info, uh, phone settings, or a nav map. If you want to see more of what's in the middle, a tap on the view button shrinks the dial sizes, uh, which with nav uh, gives you full screen mapping. Of particular importance in a GT style Grand Tourer is all round visibility, so you'd be pleased to know uh, that the view forward over the low slung bonnet is almost faultless. Unfortunately though, your view rearwards isn't thanks to the small rear window and the tapering roof line, which restricts your view out of the rear corners there. So it's just as well that Audi includes a standard rear view camera, which does cost extra on the Taycan to go with the all round parking sensors. Uh, if you're planning on covering distances as long as this EV range will take you, then you'll be pleased to find the uh, seats to be supportive, although we are disappointed to find that lumbar support is missing from the standard e-tron GT models equipment list. Uh, this 18-way adjustable sports seat pro though has absolutely everything you'd want, including climate and massaging functions. And across the range, all models offer the driver a wide range of seat and wheel adjustment with well-arranged pedals and also smart metal paddles on the wheel spokes which give quick access to the two-stage regenerative braking system. 
What else? Uh, well, the doors don't shut with much of a thunk, which is mainly due to their frameless construction, but it did encourage us to poke and prod a bit around the cabin and discovered that material fit and finish from the German Neckerson factory, which at first glance looks very good, isn't all solidly founded, which perhaps explains why, when you drive along, uh, there are rather more tiny creaks and rattles than you'd expect from a car of this price. Now, perhaps some of this is down to uh, the uh, selection of materials chosen with one eye on sustainability. There are plenty of them. Uh, the carpet and the floor mats, for example, they're made from Econil, which is a material that's fabricated from recycled nylon fibres reclaimed from production waste, fabric and carpet remnants or old fishing nets. And you can specify a leather-free interior, which is part upholstered with a material called Cascade. And that's created from polyester fibres made from old plastic bottles. Just to remind you that this is Ingolstadt's eco-conscious brand. Uh, plush models get illuminated e-tron branding on the dash at night too. Provision for oddment storage around the cabin isn't particularly generous. Both the glove box, which has a pen clip, and the door bins are somewhat restricted in size, and the lidded bin between the seats here isn't especially large either. It does incorporate a wireless phone charger, a 12-volt socket, and two USB slots, although they are of the USB-C variety, uh, so that necessitates a converter lead. Uh, we're surprised that the designers didn't think to cover these central cup holders. Uh, this part of the lower console would look much clarker yeah, with the kind of smart lidded finish that you get in a rival Mercedes. Uh, this branded ashtray here might work as a coin holder if you've kicked the habit. Uh, there is a storage cubby to the left of the gear selector there and there is a ticket clip on the driver's sun visor. Right, time to take a look in the rear. That's accessed via this rather narrow door aperture. Uh, there are obvious design difficulties inherent in not creating an electric vehicle of this kind as an SUV. How in an ordinary sedan body shape do you avoid the high stance which usually results from perching the passenger cabin on top of a whole bank of batteries? The kind of stance that this e-tron GT just doesn't have. How have the designers managed it? Well, very cleverly, the rear footwells here might look conventional, but they're actually hollowed out sections of the floor plan. Uh, Audi calls them foot garages, which allow your feet to be positioned at the same lower height as the battery pack, uh, rather than being placed on top of it. So you sit uh, comfortably, although not in the kind of uh, spacious surroundings which you would enjoy in a rival Tesla Model S, or indeed in the kind of uh, conventionally engined boardroom level luxury saloon that e-tron GT money would alternatively buy you. For a GT style sports saloon, headroom's actually pretty good, slightly better than the Taycan, despite the standard fitment of this vast panoramic glass roof, without which this part of the cabin would, after all, feel rather dark and claustrophobic. Uh, in theory, the cabin is wide enough to take three adults, but uh, that's discouraged by the sculpting of the two outer seats and by the prominence of this central transmission tunnel here. It's the kind of thing, actually, that you'd think you wouldn't need on an EV at all. There's no optional rear passenger central touchscreen display of the kind that you can have on the Taycan, but the rear climate controls below these twin vents are standard, and on this Vorsprung model, you get heated seats too. There are some things we're a bit disappointed by. Uh, the tiny door bins, the lack of rear seat back pockets, and the way that the cup holders in this fold-out armrest aren't properly covered, but there are also some lovely touches. The beautifully integrated Bang & Olufsen door speakers, the extra coat hooks on the B-pillars, the vents in the footwells, and the illuminated door sill inlays. On this top variant, you also get this beautiful suede-like Dynamica trimming uh, for the doors and the roof liner. Right, let's finish with a look at boot space and start not at the boot, but here at the front. Yes, like a Tesla Model S, you get a little storage space beneath the bonnet, which is activated uh, by a tiny switch that you'll spend ages looking for. It's on the inside open part of the driver's door. The space you get in here is tiny too, just 85 litres of it, around half the size of the one in the Tesla. Still, it's nicely lit with little compartments either side uh, for essential tools. In an Audi Oversight, those on the right are Porsche branded. 
Anyway, it all means that anything of any size will have to be stored in the rear cargo area accessed via this power operated boot lid, which can be activated by a swipe of your foot beneath the bumper and which rises to reveal a rather narrow opening and a 366 litre space, which is 39 litres more than you'll get in the Taycan. In this case, the room on offer is quite substantially accounted for by this charging lead case. And with this in place, you might really struggle to get a big suitcase in, but you might be able to leave the charging case in the garage, given that whatever mains lead you'll most regularly use can be stored either in the front or in this uh, narrow, shallow compartment beneath the floor. Smaller carry-on cases can of course be accommodated more easily. If the boot area is completely clear, up to six will apparently fit, although that's way off the 11 you could cram into a rival Tesla Model S. Still, all most owners will probably care about is that this area will be amply large enough for either a buggy or more likely a set of golf clubs. This cargo area, which is accessed via this impractical brushed stainless steel loading lip inlay, has deep recesses on both sides, a netted pocket on the left and a 12 volt socket on the right. You can attach the net to the usual floor tie down points and thanks to the flexible 40-20-40 split of the rear seat back, uh, longer items like skis can be pushed forward between two rear seated passengers. If you need to flatten everything, the space available expands to 1171 litres. From launch, prices for this e-tron GT Quattro started at around £80,000 for the standard model, although you'll need around £106,000 if you want the much more plushly equipped Vorsprung version we're trying here. If you're after more power, there's a Fastar RS e-tron GT model available for around £111,000 with a carbon black version available for around £125,000 and a top carbon Vorsprung version offered for around 133,000. Audi for the time being anyway provides only this four door GT body shape on this J1 platform. A comparable Taycan also uses it to offer a crossover style cross Turismo model. Now we've had to reference the Taycan all the way through this film. It's difficult not to do that given the amount of engineering the two models share. And given that, you're gonna to want to know uh, how the pricing of the two cars compares. Now at the time of this test in autumn 2021, you could have a Taycan from around 73,000 pounds, but that figure relates to a lower powered, rear driven powertrain format with a smaller 79.2 kilowatt hour battery, a setup that Audi's chosen not to offer here. Your comparison point instead should be the Taycan 4S, which is identical beneath the skin to this e-tron GT Quattro, but costs £4,000 more, or more realistically around £8,000 more if you swap its 79.2 kilowatt hour battery with the 93 kilowatt hour one you get fitted as standard with this Ingolstadt model. That premium though does cover you for the important addition of air suspension, which isn't fitted to the base version of this Audi. Porsche comparisons with the pricier RS e-tron GT can't be quite as exact because that 646 PS variant similarly engineered to the direct alternative, the Taycan Turbo, has slightly more power, 680 PS of it. Still, you might struggle to see how that marginal advantage justifies the Porsche model's £6,000 price premium. The Taycan range, as you might know, also offers an even faster Turbo S variant with 761 PS at an eye-watering £140,000, but that powertrain for the moment is being reserved for Zuffenhausen. Our focus here though is on this e-tron GT Quattro model and if you want this car you'll probably be attracted to it because it's so very Audi. In which case this model's other most direct rival, the Tesla Model S, won't appeal at all. You might be a bit surprised to find that these days that Tesla, which has been recently heavily updated, is vastly more expensive than either an e-tron GT or a Taycan. At the time of this test, a base Model S dual motor all-wheel drive model was retailing at around £96,000. The alternative, frenetically quick Model S Plaid, that costs around £119,000. Both those American EVs though justify the extra spend with vastly better driving range figures, 405 and 396 miles respectively. So you'll just have to decide how important that is to you. 
Now we ought to position this car in Audi's own range for you. Ingolstadt does, after all, have another Gran Turismo style EV in this segment, the rare and very underrated e-tron S Sportback, which has less power, 503 PS and 62 miles less WLTP rated driving range than an e-tron GT Quattro, but it uses the same battery and it offers the novelty of not two, but three electric motors. There are two on the rear axle to very torque for optimum corner traction. The e-tron S Sportback costs more than an e-tron GT Quattro in its base form. Uh, you're looking at around £89,000 there, but slightly less if you want top Vorsprung trim. You're looking at around £104,000 for an e-tron S Sportback Vorsprung. For reference, if you want a big Audi of this type, but you're still wedded to combustion power, you could certainly have a thirsty four litre twin turbo petrol V8 for this kind of money. It features both in the brand's five door RS7 Sportback, which has 600 PS and costs around 97,000 pounds, and in the four door Audi S8, which has 571 PS and requires around 100,000 pounds from you. If you are seriously considering an e-tron GT though, you'll be doing that because, like Audi, you've committed yourself to a future that doesn't involve burning fossil fuels. In which case, uh, what else might you be looking at in this segment? Well, the uh, Mercedes luxury EV alternative, the EQS, uh, that's rather more of a big saloon, the Grand Tourer, but in base EQS 450 plus AMG line form, and that costs around £100,000. It might well appeal to the same kind of customer that's being targeted here. A uh, few might also want to consider BMW's iX, which in top xDrive 50 form costs from around £92,000, although that's an SUV. But none of these cars are really quite the same as this Audi, and if you've come to that conclusion and you have set your heart on one of these, then your decision might be finalised by a bit of uncharacteristic generosity on Ingolstadt's part when it comes to standard equipment. So, is that what's been served up here? Well, let's see. Let's start with the features that are fitted across the range. All e-tron GTs come with front and rear motors, so four-wheel drive, along with a self-locking centre differential, a single-speed transmission on the front axle, plus a separate two-speed transmission on the rear axle. There's the Audi Drive Select driving mode system with efficiency, comfort, dynamic and individual settings, which alter the drive system and the sound profile, and which also tweak the suspension courtesy of the car's adaptive damping system. And there are steering wheel paddles to manually adjust the two available brake regeneration levels, or you can select an automatic level of recuperation from the efficiency assist section of the car's central screen. As for EV charging stuff, you get charging ports on both front wings and a 50 kilowatt DC onboard charger for use of public charging stations with a voltage of 400 volts. Your e-tron GT will also be ready for DC charging at public stations with a voltage of 800 volts. The standard AC onboard charger's capability isn't quite so impressive. It's 11 kilowatts. You'll have to pay £1,265 more for the optional e-tron charging connect system that will boost that to 22 kilowatts. Still, unlike with the Taycan, two sets of charging cables are included in the price. A Type 2 Mode 2 cable for a domestic plug and a Type 2 Mode 3 cable for a wall box or a public charger. On to what you get with the base model e-tron GT Quattro. A tick off full LED auto headlamps, 20 inch 5 twin spoke platinum grey alloy wheels, a vast panoramic glass roof, LED tail lamps, dynamic turn signals front and rear, privacy glass, power folding mirrors, a power operated tailgate you can open with gesture control, a parking system plus all round sensors, a heat pump to preserve battery range in really cold weather, keyless go keyless entry, heat insulating glass, an anti-theft alarm and metallic paint. Inside you'll get sports seats that are heated, eight-way adjustable and trimmed in twin leather, a mixture of real and artificial hide. Unfortunately though, lumbar support doesn't feature at this level. That's a feature which really ought not to be missing on a Gran Turismo style model. 
There's also a Sport Contour three-spoke leather flat bottom steering wheel through which you view the 12.3 inch Audi virtual cockpit instrument screen. Plus you get a rear view camera, an LED interior lighting pack, a frameless rear view mirror, cruise control with a speed limiter, a first aid kit, graphite gray cabin trim inlays, and three zone deluxe automatic climate control with remote preconditioning so the cabin can be cooled or warmed ready for your arrival. What about media stuff? Well, there's plenty of that. 11 antennas, all of them invisibly integrated into this Audi, connect the e-tron GT with the outside world, and the information they receive can be assessed by the driver via the car's 10.1 inch MMI touch navigation system, which comes with all the usual features, including the Audi smartphone interface, which links your handset to the vehicle's antenna and charges it inductively and can offer wireless access to Apple CarPlay and Android Auto smartphone mirroring, which by the way you can't have at all on a Tesla Model S and you only get Apple CarPlay on the Porsche Taycan. The MMI Navigation Plus setup supports the fast LTE advanced transmission standard and it uses real-time data from the prevailing traffic situation as well as destination suggestions based on previously driven routes to guide the driver. Audi Connect online services are also included. These include features like traffic information online, uh, navigation with Google Earth and Car2x communication, which uses swarm data from other road users to brief you on hazards ahead. As with all EVs, there's an available app, the My Audi app, via which you can remotely set charging times and climate settings. And this app does, of course, all the other things it would in another Audi. So there's an emergency call feature and it can transmit points of interest along your route to the navigation system. Plus, it can stream music and transfer your calendar to the MMI infotainment screen. The app also allows you to seamlessly plan a route across multiple devices. So if you're going to a restaurant in an unfamiliar city, for example, and you have to park a few streets away from the venue, then navigation will continue with you on your smartphone as you complete the journey on foot. And finally, as usual with vehicle apps of this sort, you can use it to get a vehicle status report and to lock or unlock the doors from wherever you are. So that covers the standard kit tally, which disappointingly doesn't include the three chamber air suspension system that Porsche thinks is integral to all four wheel drive versions of this design. On this Audi, you have to stretch right up to this pricey Vorsprung level of trim to get that, a level in the range at which Ingolstadt will also give you all wheel steering, the brand's more direct electromechanical power steering plus system, intelligent matrix LED headlights with piercing Audi laser light beams, and nice Night Vision Assist, which gives you rather distracting infrared nighttime viewing capability on the instrument screen. Plus, you get adaptive cruise control and a much wider range of camera safety and drive assist features, and we'll cover those off for you in a few moments. As you'd hope, given the rather substantial price hike applied to this top version, the cabin's been upgraded too. The front seats are improved to 18-way adjustable sports seats pro status, complete with ventilation, massage and memory functions. They're upholstered with a perforated honeycomb pattern and they come trimmed in fine Nappa leather. You'll also be tempted by the inclusion of a Bang & Olufsen 3D sound system with 710 watts, 16 speakers and a 15 channel amplifier and possibly also by a head-up display, a 360 degree surround view camera system, a multicolored ambient lighting setup, uh, dynamic light sequencing for the front and rear lights and a parking assistance pack which parks the car for you. Plus, Vorsprung trim also gets you heated rear seats, a black suede-like Dynamica headliner, powered steering column adjustment, acoustic window glazing, illuminated door sill scuff plates, and carbon fiber style carbon twill cabin inlays. There's the deeply cool Remote Park Assist Plus system too, which allows you to stand outside the car and park it in tight spaces using your phone. The faster RS e-tron GT model we mentioned earlier comes with a package of key e-tron GT features. The air suspension, the all-wheel steering, the electromechanical power steering plus system, uh, intelligent matrix LED headlights with Audi laser light, uh, Bang & Olufsen 3D sound system and the upgraded front sports seats pro package plus the RS derivative 
further adds larger 21 inch wheels fitted with upgraded tungsten carbide coated steel brakes with black calipers. You can order the RS model with a darker, meaner look if you go for the carbon black version, which gets a gloss carbon styling package and red themed RS interior design touches too. If you want the carbon black model with the full roster of Vorsprung features we mentioned earlier, then the top carbon Vorsprung variant will deliver that for you. Right, enough with standard features, let's look at options. With a standard e-tron GT, your Audi center salesperson will steer you towards a couple of extra cost packs, which enable you to embellish your car with selected Vorsprung features. Uh, for just over 3,500 pounds more, the comfort and sound pack adds in matrix LED headlights, along with the Bang & Olufsen 3D sound system, the parking assistance pack, and multicolored ambient lighting setup or for just over £8,000 more, which gets you the Comfort and Sound Pack Plus. You'll get all that, plus the adaptive air suspension system and the front Sports Seats Pro package with cooled ventilation and Nappa leather upholstery. Individual items you might want to add to a base e-tron GT include a head-up display and the e-tron sports sound package which delivers a throaty combustion-like powertrain soundtrack. Uh, that parking assistance pack is also available as an individual option and on an RS e-tron you can specify carbon fibre ceramic brake discs. There are lots of aesthetic options too. The single frame grille, for example, which is supplied rather unappealingly in this Heckler grey shade as standard, that can alternatively be had in body colour. As for the interior, well, to go with the whole eco vibe, you might want the black leather free interior pack, which includes upholstery in a combination of artificial leather and a new material called Cascade, which is produced using a proportion of recycled materials such as poly polyester fibres made from old plastic bottles, uh, textiles or residual fibres from salvage. Or conversely, there's a full leather package which adds hide to the upper part of the instrument panel and the doors. On an e-tron GT, you might also want to add the sport contour version of Audi's flat bottom steering wheel, uh, a suede-like dynamic headliner and carbon twill trim inlays. Uh, trim inlays are also available in worn-up grey brown. Enough with optional features, let's move on to look at safety, which, as you'd hope, is of the five-star Euro NCAP standard. This car is intrinsically very safe, thanks to its stiff J1 platform and an integrated battery system, which contributes significantly to the rigidity and crash safety of the body. As for proactive safety features, well, as you expect in this day and age, there is an autonomous braking system included. Uh, Ingolstadt calls this uh, setup Audi PreSense Front. And like other similar packages, it scans the road ahead, uh, looking for potential accident hazards as you drive. And it will automatically brake the car to try to avoid those if you don't respond to any warnings. Uh, there is also a lane departure warning setup, which issues a warning if you drift out of your lane on the highway and will then apply subtle steering assistance to ease you back to where you ought to be. Uh, there is also rest recommendation. Now that obviously monitors your driving reactions for drowsiness. There's distance warning, uh, which tells you if you're getting rather too close to the vehicle in front of you. And there's Audi pre-sense, which senses if an accident impact is inevitable and braces the car to better withstand it by instantly closing all the windows and by pre-tensioning the seat belts. In addition, you can add an emergency assist feature, which is able to autonomously bring the car to a safe controlled stop if you don't respond to repeated warnings about drifting out of lane, as might be the case, for example, if you are suddenly taken ill at the wheel. To go further, you'll need two packs, which Audi calls Tour and City Assist, both included as standard only if you get an e-tron GT or RS e-tron GT equipped to top Vorsprung spec. Tour includes two features which really ought to be standard on a Gran Turismo style model of this price. One is traffic sign recognition, the other is adaptive cruise assist, which uses a radar sensor, a laser scanner, a front camera and ultrasonic sensors, all networked 
network together to permanently monitor your e-tron GT surroundings, uh, drawing on feedback from those systems, plus uh, local speed restrictions and navigation data too. Adaptive Cruise Assist will be able to help you to more proactively control acceleration, braking, lane positioning and distance to the vehicle in front all at any speed and with functionality which is equally effective whether you're stuck in traffic or completely alone on the road. As for the City Assist Pack, well that gives you four features, an intersection assist, cross traffic assist front feature, which warns the driver of traffic crossing to the front or to the side of the vehicle that he or she might be about to steer in front of. There's side assist lane change warning, which stops you from dangerously pulling out in front of another vehicle. Uh, there's cross traffic assist rear, now that warns you if you're just about to reverse into something. And there is exit warning too, which warns occupants if they're just about to open their doors in the face of oncoming traffic. Now this all means that in driving any kind of e-tron GT, there are lots of safety systems to oversee, particularly if you've ticked a few options boxes. So how on earth can you monitor all the different features in everyday driving and decide which ones you want to activate on any given time? Well, Audi's tried to simplify that process here by providing a driver assist section in the central screen. That's there to allow the selection of the kind of electronic security blanket that you want. Now, basic includes only the most important items. Maximum, well, that gives you absolutely everything. And individual allows you to pick and choose the features that you want to activate. Of course, safety isn't just about camera features for driver and front passenger. There are full-size airbags, knee bags and side bags, plus curtain airbags along the entire roof frame and on the side windows from A pillar to C pillar. There are the usual electronic systems too for control of traction, stability and braking. And there's a rollover detection system for activation of the curtain airbags and seatbelt pretensioners. Uh, other passive safety features include TPM, tire pressure monitoring, an active bonnet and ISFIX charge seat fastenings. It's difficult to remember a time when automotive technology was so far ahead of what real world infrastructure can actually support. Uh, you really see that when it comes to uh, the autonomous drive capability, which hardly anyone in the world is legally allowed to actually use. And uh, you also see it when it comes to the 800 volt power supply system that this e-tron GT is able to offer. It certainly sounds good. It's borrowed from tech developed through Porsche's World Endurance Championship Motorsport Program, where the 800 volt setup made the company's 919 hybrid race cars, hybrid system batteries, able to recharge themselves quicker. Plus the higher voltage meant that the engineers could drop the capacity of the current circulating around the powertrain. Uh, that in turn enabled them to fit thinner cables, which meant a useful saving in weight. It's less easy though to see the benefit of the 800 volt system here. So it doesn't make this car go any further on a single charge, which is disappointing as this is the one area, uh, the one crucial area you might think, in which this car really loses out to its luxury EV rivals and particularly to Tesla badged ones. In this Audi's home German market where the public charging infrastructure is relatively well advanced, you could to some extent argue that this might not actually matter much there on just about any continental intercity journey you're likely to attempt, you'll be able to find high output DC rapid charges that are able to replenish your e-tron GT's lithium ion cells in not much longer than the time it would take you to down a cafe au lait and a plate of strudel, particularly if the charger in question is one of the gutsiest ionity ones able to sustain 270 kilowatts of charging regime, a proper ultra fast access to which is the main raison d'etre for this car's expensive 800 volt onboard power source tech. When public DC charges like that are commonplace, this Audi will enjoy a significant cabled up advantage over the kind of older tech 400 volt setup, which at the time of this test in autumn 2021, all this model's uh, luxury EV rivals still featured, with the exception of course, of this model's identically engineered Porsche Taycan cousin. 
Doubling the voltage power supply and charging at 270 kilowatts allows the 93 kilowatt hour battery that all versions of this Audi use to receive as much as 62 miles of range in as little as five minutes or to go from a 10 to 80 percent charged up capacity in just 21 minutes. Even Tesla's supercharging stations can't match that. But the problem is, of course, that in this country, 270 kilowatt public DC chargers are rarer than hen's teeth. Although over 400 new ones are opened across Europe each year, not many of those uh, seem to be appearing here in the UK. At the time of this test in autumn 2021, there were only 15 on these shores, and I honestly say that only 40 are planned in total for the UK. Uh, drive, say, from Inverness to London, and you'll only encounter two. Not even every Audi centre in this country has one, although your nearest dealership might just have sorted that issue out and got itself wired up by the time you actually view this film. What it all boils down to is that your best case scenario is probably to find a 400 volt public charging station which will allow you to charge at up to 50 kilowatts. Now these of course are much more common and you'll be able to uh, locate one and you'll be able to choose from several different providers via a dedicated section of the brand's My Audi app. Audi drivers have access to the ECS, the e-tron charging service, which at the time of this test had 11,950 affiliated charging points in the UK alone, all of which should be discoverable via the car's navigation system, uh, which usefully recommends charges along any preset route. Uh, you can pay for each connected up session with a single membership card, and that entitles you to fixed tariff use. At a typical 50 kilowatt DC charger, you can add up to 62 miles of range to the 93 kilowatt hour battery pack in 28 minutes or fill the battery from 5 to 80 percent in 93 minutes. Audi points out rather self-evidently that 80% of actual charging on this car, uh, you can choose either of the sockets you'll find situated on both front wings, will usually be done in an AC garage wall box at home. With a 93 kilowatt hour battery pack that all versions of this car use, only 86 kilowatt hours of which is actually usable, uh, with its 33 modules and 12 pouch cells, that kind of more typical charging will take nine hours with an 11 kilowatt charger, 10 and a half hours with a 9.6 kilowatt charger and 14 hours with a 7 kilowatt charger. If you have access to a three-phase charging power supply or perhaps you want to dig up your driveway to install it, uh, you can reduce those times by paying extra for the optional 22 kilowatt onboard AC charger and that'll increase maximum charging power with AC current. You can set charging levels via a dedicated charging section of the MMI Touch Center Dash infotainment screen and you can set levels and timings via a special section of the My Audi app. So once you've charged up, just how far will you be able to go? Well, we referenced earlier the fact that this Audi's WLTP rated range readings were a touch disappointing by luxury EV standards. Uh, let's get specific. In our driving experience section, we referenced uh, this e-tron GT model's WLTP rated combined cycle range figure of 298 miles, which is for some reason 10 miles more than the figure quoted for a mechanically identical and aerodynamically slightly sleeker Porsche Taycan 4S with the same sized battery. Uh, there is a range potential screen on the central display which has a green band and that shows how far you can go on your current charge. As you might know, with an EV, efficiency actually improves rather than falls in slow-moving city traffic thanks to extra energy regenerated in stop-start driving conditions. And in this case, uh, tests have shown that if you were driving an e-tron GT exclusively at city speeds, you could potentially get up to 38 more miles out of it. You'll want some perspective on this. Uh, the e-tron GT might be notably slippery in shape with a drag coefficient of 0.24 CD. It's the sleekest car that Audi's ever made, but the fact remains that it's not difficult to find a large luxury crossover class EV, uh, the sort of model which in contrast has the aerodynamics of a barn door, able to go slightly further on a single charge. Take the 300 mile range of the Jaguar I-Pace for example. In certain conditions, you might even get as far or slightly further in a little Renault Zoe with a battery almost half the size. 
Uh, of course, it is more relevant here to compare this Audi instead against the GT style models which share the e-tron GT model's price point and its ethos too. It is worth noting that an equivalently priced Audi e-tron S Sportback manages only 226 miles of WLTP combined cycle range but it is quite shocking to then go on and realize that a comparably priced Tesla Model S in mainstream dual motor all wheel drive form can almost double that to 405 miles combined. A high performance Tesla Model S Plaid, which gets to 60 in under two seconds, has a quoted range of 396 miles. That's a figure that it must be quite painful for Audi to hear, given that a supposedly comparable RS e-tron GT can only manage 283 miles. Remember that the e-tron GT figures we just quoted will only be possible if you drive with the efficiency mode selected, uh, which always starts the car in second gear, turns down the climate control and limits top speed to 87 miles an hour. Uh, with that in place, drivetrain energy consumption is about 3.4 miles per kilowatt, a figure you can monitor from a readout in the center of the left-hand dial in the instrument cluster. And in its efficiency setting, this Audi is most true to the dashboard's range prediction. Uh, which we do have to say has rarely been the case with the various Tesla models that we've tested. Uh, the NEDC rated figures that Audi gave us suggest that this e-tron GT will consume between 80.8 and 19.6 kilowatt hours of energy per 62 miles covered on average. For the RS model the figures are 19.3 to 20.2 kilowatt hours. You can monitor energy consumption progress via a selectable data section which can display in the center of the instrument screen and this offers both short and long-term readings and it's also worth mentioning that Audi includes a heat pump as standard. Now this often is a pricey extra with an EV and this mitigates against loss of driving range which could happen in the coldest months. Uh, the heat pump replaces the car's usual uh, thermoelectric heating element in freezing conditions. A word about brake energy regeneration, or recuperation as Addy calls it. It's fashionable at the moment with EVs to interact with systems that allow you to vary the level of brake regeneration via steering wheel paddles or to engage in what's termed single pedal driving in which you virtually never use the brake so a resting is the regenerative decelerating effect every time you release the throttle. In an e-tron GT there's very little of that. You do get steering wheel brake regeneration paddles which are lacking on the equivalent Porsche but they only activate two manual settings uh, neither of which seems to make very much difference to the extent that the car slows when you come off the accelerator. Uh, you'll mostly just end up selecting the automatic recuperation setting from the central screen and leave the car to do its own thing which is a better solution anyway because with that setting selected the system can regenerate up to 90% of braking energy a recuperation output of up to 265 kilowatts of energy ready to be fed back into this Audi's battery no other EV uh, bar this model's Porsche cousin can manage this to that extent in fact during everyday driving in this e-tron GT up to a third of your driving range can be derived exclusively from recuperation to give you just one example of that, if you were braking from 124 miles an hour right down to rest in this car, you'd recover enough energy uh, to then travel for up to two and a half miles. It's all quite astonishing. What else might you need to know? Um, insurance, well, all e-tron GT variants are rated at a top of the shop group 50p, as of course are their RS e-tron GT stablemates. There's obviously a much wider dealer network than Porsche can offer, and you'll only need to visit your local Audi center every two years or every 20,000 miles for maintenance, uh, whichever comes around first. Servicing should be less expensive than it is for a combustion engine model. An electric vehicle does, after all, have 20% fewer moving parts and thanks to the recuperation management system and this model's very limited use of friction braking you'll hardly ever have to replace the brake pads the brand reckons that uh, every six years should be sufficient Audi offers three levels of prepaid servicing packages with this car a level one which at the time of this test costs 399 pounds that covers you for 18 months and one service level two costs 785 pounds and two services over three years and level three costs 880 pounds and covers you for two services, two MOT tests in the third and fourth years of ownership. 
This model is covered by a three-year 60,000 mile warranty plus Audi issues an eight-year or 100,000 mile warranty that guarantees battery performance, although not to 100%. This e-tron GT also has 12 years of corrosion cover and a three-year paint guarantee. Uh, when you decide to sell on your car, you should find that this Audi's premium reputation will help shore up its value. As for depreciation, well, when we tested the Taycan, we briefed you on the fact that after three years and 36,000 miles, uh, uh, that Porsche was expected by industry experts CAP to return 60% of its original value. We'd expect the e-tron GT's figure to be closer to that of a Tesla Model S, which is 57%. Still, after four years of ownership of this e-tron GT, you'd be likely to get more of your money back uh, than you would after three years of driving a direct combustion engine Audi alternative, like say an RS7 Sportback or an S8. Bear in mind that depreciation will take a hit if you load the car up with too many unnecessary and pricey extras. What else? Well, you won't only be saving money on energy costs, driving into congestion charger zones will be free, until 2025 anyway, and you should also make savings on VED road tax. Specifically, there's no VED road charge to pay for year one of ownership, nor will you be saddled with the premium VED supplement, which owners of a luxury car of this size and price would normally be expected to find. More significantly, your company benefit in kind tax rating will be pitched at 1%, which at the time of this test meant an annual payment from around £319 for higher rate 40% earners or from around £160 for lower rated earners. It's then just 2% for the second year of ownership. The e-tron GT's 1% BIK rating obviously makes quite a difference. To give you some perspective on that, uh, let's tell you that a higher rate taxpayer driving an Audi S8 will be charged more than £16,000 a year for their company perk. Uh, this uncharacteristic generosity on the part of HMRC is of course down to the fact that, like any EV, this one claims a zero emission CO2 figure, although of course the energy to drive this car has to come from somewhere and it causes with pollution somewhere uh, using a well to wheels calculation based on typical use of the UK's energy grid the burden of filling up batteries in this car will result in a theoretical 42.8 grams per kilometer of CO2 being released into the atmosphere now that is certainly good but it is some way from being completely green Still, this car does try to be. Its carpet and floor mats are made from Econil, a material fabricated from recycled nylon fibers, reclaimed from production waste, fabric and carpet remnants or old fishing nets. Uh, you can specify a vegan interior with upholstery made from recycled plastic bottles. And it's screwed together in a factory with a net zero carbon footprint based at a site using 100% eco-electricity and heated by biogas. All good to know. Whether you choose this e-tron GT rather than its directly comparable Porsche Taycan cousin will of course be very much down to personal preference. Both cars are more appealing than the aging Tesla Model S direct alternative, providing you can put up with a considerably shorter driving range. VW Group EV engineers are feverishly working on this and improvements can't come too soon. Those for whom the current 300 mile figure is sufficient will find much to like here, providing they can afford the premium asking price, of course. We had expected more of a cost difference in Audi's favor between the two cars, but even so, the e-tron GT Quattro shades its cousin on value too, especially once you take specification into account and you get a more visually appealing and sumptuous cabin than is offered by the Porsche. The cabin isn't particularly spacious for a car five meters long and we'd expected a better quality of ride from a model selling itself as a luxury GT, a more grand touring orientated alternative to a Taycan. And it's in this role that this standard e-tron GT Quattro model makes far more sense in the range. It's faster, pricier RS e-tron GT showroom stablemate merely offers a rather pointless slug of extra power for an awful lot more money. As for the much trumpeted 800 volt electrical system, which features with both variants and their Taycan cousins, well, that's not much use to British customers who are saddled with an undeveloped 
public charging infrastructure, that for the time being anyway, will rarely enable them to get the benefit of that sophisticated tech. But you can forgive this e-tron GT much because it's just such a lovely thing to look at. And to some extent at least, it really does feel like an Ingolstadt product to drive in terms of steering and the excellent quality of ride. Here then, finally, is an Audi EV you might really desire. It'll give the brand's sensible e-tron badge some much needed want one factor.